Anna Bagarov. I'm the publisher of Artillery, and it's my honor to introduce Ezra Black, who is our staff writer of Artillery. Ezra G. Black is a well-known, respected LA writer and critic who's been covering the art and popular culture for decades, starting with the LA Weekly as a theater critic. She profiled Baldessari in 2010, um, which was Artillery's cover feature and has written numerous articles on him throughout his career. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, um, for that uh, 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 altogether too laudatory introduction. Um, thank you for the compliment. Nice to get the compliment. Um, but in the meantime, we have a very distinguished um, panel of uh, professionals in the uh, world of printmaking and uh, fine art lithography, including uh, uh, Shia Ramba, Milo Smolin, uh, Francesco Siqueiros, and, uh, and Jean Milan of uh, Cirrus, and, and Jacob Samuel, and, and also um, uh, John's uh, studio assistants, uh, Brienne and um, and why am I drawing a blank on the last name? Um, Arrington. Arrington. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Amanda. Amanda. So forget, forgive me. And Amanda, Amanda McGuff as well. Um, if 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 you would all, if you wouldn't mind all introducing yourselves. I'm Jean Milan from Sears Gallery and Sears Editions Limited. And uh, Amanda, I'm going to just take sure. you in the queue as I see you guys. Uh, and Amanda? Sure. Uh, my name is Amanda McGew. I'm an artist and um, have worked with John or worked with John for a number of years uh, as one of his um, production people. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I apologize for uh, I apologize for uh, mispronouncing your name. <laughs> oh, don't worry. It happens a lot. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. And, and Jeff? Yeah, I'm Jeff McMahon from Gemini GEL, um, the one of the screen printers there. Um, yeah, I've been there from uh, 2011 to the present, um, printing mostly John's work with the screenshot. Uh, oh, so it was mostly John. That's very interesting. And I think the last time the last time I saw you was at I think uh, John's uh, show of his. Uh, those um series those fashion series that he did wow. yeah i believe that was there and shia well i am a shia Remba from the mixographia workshop also we had the honor and pleasure to collaborate with john for many years in many different uh, projects Brian. I am Brianne Arrington. Um, I worked with John in his studio for many years and also with Amanda um, co-founded Multi Editions. Mm, great. And, um, and Jacob? Uh, yeah, I uh, published uh, etchings for 30 years and then uh, uh, stopped publishing uh, in, 19, or rather in uh, 2015. And I've been teaching uh, pr printmaking at UCLA for the last 11 years. Oh, wow. Okay, so um, I mean, I, I as I understand it, like all of you have very very diverse backgrounds. But what I want to draw everyone out is on today is oh Milo, I didn't get, I, I don't think you introduced yourself, Milo. Milo, no, he's sound. Hi, I'm I'm just uh, presenting the the slides. I'm not um, participating in the panel. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. I I, just, I I thought we would have some some involvement, but that's fine. You know, it, either way. Um. So, uh, you know, I I'd like to maybe start out by um, with with everyone talking a little bit about their association with with John um, and how his work evolved or how you observed his work evolving as you worked with him. Um, as we know, John was a, a kind of the original um, post-studio uh, artist and, um, and very much in his head, although he had his own practices and procedures as do most printers. And so 
if you would, you know, maybe d describe, you know, your, your sort of evolutions with John. Um, maybe starting with Jean, because I think Jean goes uh, furthest back with, with, um, with John. Is, uh, that so, is, is that so, Jean? I, I think so for in LA. Uh, we first worked with him in 1976, but I was aware of him before that. Um, actually, um, the I Will Not Make Any More Boring Art Print was uh, done by one of my fellow uh, Hammond printers in Halifax. And, uh, Nova Scotia. So that was, I think, his first actual lithograph. Um, but I was actually um, introduced sort of more formally to John by um, Connie Llewellyn, who was working for me at the time. And she knew John from San Diego, UC San Diego, because her husband was teaching that. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of like uh, suggested that I work with John. And um, so we approached him and that uh, he wasn't that interested in doing the print at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, the print we ended the project we did with him, I think, might have been the first portfolio he was had published. It consists of six images, and each image was a photo that he took himself from the um, Santa Monica Mall, and then um, we we tipped those into a, a debossed area on the paper, and he chose one line and one color forma elements from the photograph and then positioned them into the larger rectangle. So kind of like right from the beginning, you could see that John was really kind of very formally involved in making art. And, um, and I think that's sort of, I've seen that continue through his career. And I think he actually at one point I was at some panel discussion or interview and he sort of mentioned that it was later in life that he was coming out of the closet that he's really a formal artist. And mm -hmm. That kind of carries through all of the work that he's done. You can see there's this real attention to formal, formal art making. Um, I don't think he did that many prints after that. And of course, you know, I had some of my artists that I was showing the gallery were teaching at Cal Arts at that time, so it was a really crazy fun time of Cal Arts history. And we did show Paul Brock also, but so that was, you know, I was very aware of what was going on and. Um, John certainly was, you know, a major element in that uh, involvement with uh, the Post Studio. And um, so I think we didn't do any work with him until 1986. We might have uh, done some uh, sort of like fundraiser projects for some other places. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, at that time we did, and I, I think if people see it, the photo that's up now is him working on a, one of his first major panel pieces uh, called The Fallen Easel. And it was kind of like, um, um, he, he was always open to any kind of suggestions, but he had definitely uh, ideas. And you see him here kind of extracting uh, a panel from five metal panels that were used in the print from a photograph that was from, like, I don't know the name of the film, but it was um, sort of like a scenario of like a military uh, powwow. So he was like connecting one head to another head at the end, other end of the table or whatever. And then um, uh, we used many different kinds of papers at that time for it. So there was a uh, very slick paper that was very commercial and the image of that was sort of kind of very corporate, three guys standing looking like they're at a corporate uh, event. And uh, then we did something that was uh, a four pan, a, a very large panel that was four color separation. At the time, that kind of printing was very difficult. They pre digital and all this stuff, and you mm -hmm. had four color separations and printing on very fuzzy rag paper. So you know there were a lot of technical elements in that print. Like we mm -hmm. printed on the metal, and then we had the metal cut. We had it lacquered, and having to deal with the different kinds of um, of papers. And some, one of the panels was so large that the press couldn't even do it. So we had to piece that one together. But now, did he make any, did he, just sorry to interrupt, but did he make any, um, uh, you know, ch changes while you were doing that? Did he make, did he have, you know, second thoughts? Did he intervene no, or? No, really at this particular project, it was pretty much straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, so that wasn't the case, but on, uh, on another project, I, I don't remember him intervening that much, maybe some small color changes or something like that. So once but, the process was underway, it was it was sort of a done thing. Yes, pretty much, I right. think, yeah. 
Right. But also I should point out that, you know, the first project, the raw prints, when we did the, those prints, uh, it wasn't considered, photography was not considered fine art at the time. And these are C prints, so they can fade. They were done at a drugstore. <laughs> And, um, you know, we couldn't really even sell the prints because it just because they had those photographs and uh, print at that time had to be to kids of fine art had to really be drawn by hand by the artist. Right. And so since John had never done a print before, you can see on this photo, there's a very the line delineating the larger rectangle is very crisp and thin. And I was also so amazed because technically that's almost impossible to do with a, a very greasy soft lithogram <laughs> and he just it was very immediate it was just zap 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 he did it um and i guess the only other kind of real hand involvement was a series that we did called cliches and he hadn't really painted for many many years but in that series the upper portion of each print he actually suggested doing wanted to do something painting we suggested this process with washes and so he you know did it with uh, litho washes and they were absolutely beautiful, technically. Um, so uh, the people ask a lot of times why, he said they ask him why he puts the dots on the heads. And he said he puts the dots on the heads because he doesn't want any emotional involvement with the image of the individual to enter into the piece. Mm -hmm. That was kind of what he, I think I remember him telling me, um, just to blot that out. And, and of course the raw prints, the first prints, contain three colors, uh, primaries and three secondaries. So he's always used the three primary colors in a lot of his work. And uh, they have mm -hmm. a color sequence where you could hang them red, orange, yellow. Uh, so, you know, how they colors mix to make the other color. Mm -hmm. And um, we did another large uh, panel piece uh, object with flaw. This is the object with flaw. Right. And that involved printing on a piece of plastic from the back. So you're, and it's a frosted plastic. So it was, that was a very kind of difficult project and it had to be hand cut out because they didn't have laser cutters at the time. So, you know, a lot of this technology doesn't exist anymore. Right. Yeah, like four color separations, large scale and stuff like that. Um, and then a lot of the, uh, the dots and some of the other elements were silk screened on top of the lithography. That's a particularly brilliant specimen there I would That's say. That's a pretty nice. Piece. I mean just in terms of the geometry, in terms of the arc, there's so much going on there. Right. So much going on. Maybe we should like um, move this along. I mean um, does anyone have a comment before uh, we we move on to one of our other uh, printers? Not to cut you short, Jean. No, I mean, that's fine. Have, no problem. If, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a pretty stunning image uh, right there. Um, uh, it's interesting, though, also, I mean, at some point, I'd like to draw someone out about just um, the idea of, I mean, I, I think about the, the dots over the faces. I always think that goes to a sort of very basic idea um, with respect to John's work, which has to do with simply the nature of cognition and the nature of knowledge and specifically the very human human cognition and human understanding of what quote unquote knowledge is. Um, but we can discuss that later. But um, so why don't we talk to, who, wa who wants to jump in? Well, I, I, I can jump in. Okay. No yeah, there, there's a there's a big blue horizon in front of us. I'd love to jump into something like that right now. Well, then that should be Brian or Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to do you want to say something, Shia? Well, I was going to talk more or less about the projects we did with John. So mm. what we are. Uh, with mixographia, probably as a workshop, we were the last ones to, let's say, to start uh, collaborating with, uh, with John, uh, because, you know, we immigrated to Mexico, and then uh, in the 80s, and we didn't start to work with John up 
up until the 1990s, which became this project. So, and uh, we came the idea with the idea of producing uh, some three dimensional prints with John. So, for him, the way he conceived the collaboration was to create this object on handmade paper that became the lamps. So these are very, uh, it's a very thick animated paper that was uh, cut out, you know, in the shape, and then he hand painted. So also here uh, we are having a print, a hand painted print by John, and happens that he was totally anti paint but he, he kind of liked it when he conceived how to color all the images. He had all these diagrams of how to approach this project, probably more like a system, uh, like a, you know, like a mathematical problem, which the solution is a combination of shapes with colors in 36 variations. So that's, uh, it, it evolved, you know, for, for us, we had to prepare more than a ton of, of, of pulp to make the paper. So this is just so you get the, the from uh, the workshop, the involvement, that's what it took, you know like oh, close to 3,000 pounds of cotton in this project, just to make this one inch thick uh, paper object. But he ended up liking the whole production of it. But at the end, you know, when he was done, this the first thing, I want this out of my studio. Taking <laughs> So I can imagine. The first uh, project we did with him. And later on, he explored, uh, he creates Stonehenge, which also was this kind of mathematical approach of uh, variations, you know, uh, layers at different levels and combinations and permutations. <clears throat> same color palette that he used throughout his career, basically, you know, the primary colors. So, you know, everything, uh, the, all the project we did with him, you know, was really a type of collaboration, uh, more based like, like on a dialogue, you know, because he used to come with an idea and then, okay, what's next? So then we would propose something, and then he would, let's make another suggestion, and, and this way the, the project evolved totally based on his ideas. But I think uh, it was great that he was open and probably absolutely because of his practice he was open to the collaboration you know it it was his idea but i, I think was. yeah i think that's apparent and i mean what's what's extraordinary is that um it it is taken on a, a very rigorous technical level i mean i have some uh, i'm some i i don't have really any knowledge of it specifically, but I know what a complicated process, different kinds of like photolithography and photointaglio and, uh, uh, you know, entails. It's very complicated. You know, I'd like to hear from uh, John's really closest uh, collaborators, Amanda and Brienne, about this, uh, about that kind of dialogue and collaboration and, um, Brian or um, Amanda, could, could one of you start talking about, telling us a little bit about the, the, the initial stage, the instigation of these processes and as they connected with the printmaking studio. I think it would be useful to hear something about that now. 
Or where you want to talk about, yeah, you want to start it out? Or yeah. Yeah. I, you know, one thing I remember John always saying a lot was that um, work came from work for him. Um, you know, he would try to work through ideas through series and many different iterations, um, maybe even of the same theme to sort of get to the, the next step. Um, and during that time of like Stonehenge, he was really doing a lot of, and his unique work was doing a lot of these like multi-layered um, sort of three-dimensional paintings uh, with foregrounds, backgrounds and midgrounds. Um, and, you know, he had very specific ideas for the unique works, but then they sort of spilled over into his prints and actually at a certain time between like 2004 and 2010 he was just really on this this kick for this three this three-dimensional sort of painting work um and it really spilled over into like so many of his unique works and then also into the editions with pretty much all of most of the publishers um mm -hmm. so yeah it was just part of the process that he would have to think through ideas to be able to to get to the next step of an idea or the next iteration of an idea. Um, and yeah, he just, he focused on that, that particular body of work for a really long time, that three-dimensional uh, painting work. I think there's also like a reverse of that because I know when we did the cliche project uh, that he had mentioned to me that that was something that then went into his next exhibition of like the original work. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, it goes back and forth with with him too. It's sort of like, if you say work comes out of work, I mean, it's yeah. like, um, ideas are created in the collaborative uh, envi environment. Uh, yeah, that makes complete sense. Right, yeah. so it's a very fluid type thing for a lot of artists. And I think that's something also that John has always enjoyed with uh, collaborating with people, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that what was really cool about printmaking for him and collaborating with publishers in particular, though, was that maybe, you know, Brie can speak more to earlier works because she's been with the studio so much longer. But, um, you know, in my experience uh, with publishers, John was really, really open to feedback and right. um, and suggestions based on like material limits. Um, and that was really cool because I think kind of what you like hinted at before, um, it was more process oriented and, and, and so there are just material restrictions to like what an image could be. And so you really did see him go back and forth with, um, other ideas, maybe a, with a little more flexibility than, than, uh, his unique works. I mean, that was, you know, we kept it, you know, as an assistant, you, you, you make a boundary, you know, um, you, you want to fulfill someone's idea, but then you kind of just like stop there. And when, you know, and I feel like with printmaking um, in particular, it, it allowed him to be more open to ideas um, and it presented him with new limitations, which is really cool and beautiful to see. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Brian, do you want to uh, go uh, go further with that, or no? I think maybe let somebody else. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, I just I, I was just enjoying like the images, like uh, going back and forth on the screen. They were very beautiful. I especially love that um, the, uh, the, the 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 toe, the toe and and the foot right. um, with the exposed toe. That's such a an amazing uh yeah that's actually my toe there <laughs> oh my god that's now that i'm looking at <laughs> um yeah that was actually a, a pretty interesting series that um black stock was like an applique that um that gemini had sort of applied to the i would guess it's a silk screen um and so again it's like you know, he was layering, he was using these different, you know, grounds. Um, and that actually is, um, this work is, this print is like reminiscent of like an old work that he had done and also a newer work that he had done later on with Francesco. 
Right. So again, like, you know, work coming from work, um, a lot of those themes are sort of recycled throughout. Right. Would uh, you work with Francesca? Yeah, I'm just career. curious. Which, um, I'm not sure if, uh, if there's an image, but um, the red slipper, Francesca? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Exactly. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that was, it's funny. I, I mean, it has a, it has a slightly different, that's a completely, a, a new different, completely, I, I'm suddenly in shock, just the, the shock of the slipper. Um, a sort of a, 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 a bleak sort of turn away on that uh, theme a little bit. Um, the other one has this very hulking figurative theme and this sort of returns you to a slightly different place, uh, especially with the way you see the demarcation of the, the instep there. Um, uh, who wants to, do you, Jeff, or Jeff or Francesca, do you want to um, take it from, from, from there? Um, well, the image, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, yeah, well, John's collaboration with Gemini uh, really got going back like in the early 90s. Um, and up to that point, Gemini didn't really have a screen shop you know, we had done some projects and where they had done some projects, um, but they were mostly job it out. Um, and with John's images and so much of them using this four color process technique, um, it really caused the screenshot to be born and to uh, pursue this like technique, all the technical aspects that come into taking these images that he's like gotten from other places and are so, uh, you know, it's a it's an image of a, of a scan of a print of an image of a scan of a print that we're then taking and trying to reprint and new object like just like the ceilings. Um, so John's like involvement with Gemini has really pushed us to come up with new ways to actually let his images like exist as prints themselves. This specific mm -hmm. one, the Carl Lagerfeld one. Um, with the traditional four color process printing method, there's certain colors that you just can't ever truly get to print. Um, these bright reds and things, you know, all the reds are made of magenta and yellow, and there's always a little bit of blue in it, or the blues always have a little bit of red in it. So we can never get this like really vibrant color just by doing the simple method. So um, Richard Kaz, the uh, master screen printer at Gemini, has developed this incredible technique of almost painting with silk screens where he starts we start with really base down versions of all the dots and slowly add, uh, we'll add like a blue. In the case of this dog here, we added um, like a nice uh, orangey brown over the fur that's on the very right side. So it actually is a little bit raised over the fur on the back. There's mm -hmm. only a red in the gums to really have that nice like deep richness to it. Um, and that's always been our our priority when printing John's work is making these images feel rich and feel like they have this depth to them that is not just, you know, ju not just another reproduction, not just another uh, part of a series of degradations, but a final realized art piece that is interesting and compelling to look at and feels like a finished print. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been an amazing experience to learn from John and just, uh, he really trusted our shop to um, do what we could with his images. He would provide us, Brian and Amanda would provide us with uh, digital prints and files with everything. And then we would just hit the ground running and try to do it the best we could. Um, there was a series recently with the emojis. Um, and like John never told us to add clear coats or anything like that, but it was always our goal to make these images feel luscious. And to, like that feeling of, of going to John's studio to have him sign the prints at the very end when you know, he's seen the RTP, but he hasn't really seen how much work we're gonna put into the edition. Um, and like watching his eyes light up when he got to see his own work like translated into this new medium that is relatively unpredictable. Um, it's been an interesting experience printing with Gemini for sure. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. the it, it's interesting, I mean, how vividly uh, some of that color registers. Um, it, it's, uh, you, Gemini did an amazing job on some of those, um, some of those prints. They're really, uh, they're really astonishing. I, I mean, and I remember them uh, quite vividly uh, um, from, I, I think it was like about 2015, I think some of these are from, or this is 2016, that's right. This um, is so where he, these are all from a series of uh, Cezanne's paintings where he would- Right, his, you know, his, his, his wife's uh, uh, coiffure. <laughs> idea of like getting you to look at these things in a different way and to you know uh it takes the context out of the painting and gives it a new meaning and just trying to print these things was a whole like level of absurdity in itself where you're printing these giant flesh tones we did uh, a series of eight of them and they're all you know about 40 inches wide um 46 inches i guess um and so we had to mix up like a five gallon bucket of this flesh colored ink to maintain consistency and, and uh, it becomes your life. Like it, these images were my life for a good few months of- Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really amazing thing to bring off that um, graphic demarcation. In other words, that, you know, the positive, the flesh, yeah. the, the darkness, the, uh, this, it it turns it into it, you know an abstraction that can be flipped around in so many ways and um i mean to draw out the color that way um to make it as precise and as rich as as it is um really has magnifies the impact of the idea so much um so uh yeah i, I i've always been that that's something that's always been striking about the print and um yeah, and i think and certainly there the composition where sometimes you know those dots the circles will be right on the edge of the paper and he john would be particular about you know where the relationship of these formal elements within the print you know mm -hmm. which would always provide its own technical challenge oh yeah yeah uh he understood he understood uh as I, I mean, I've I always looked to him as kind of someone who uh, he could have had he had a fine art career. He could have also had a Hollywood career. He would have been a great editor. He un he really understood mise en scène, you know. Um, <laughs> um, he had a, an amazing understanding of that, an amazing sense of that kind of orchestration of elements. Even though he's like he pushes us away from like the notion of reading any kind of like physiognomic reading. Um, so um, I, I think we were talking with uh, briefly with uh, Francesco. Uh, Francesco, do, do you want to yeah. talk a bit? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, uh, it's really great to be with uh, all of you and thank you for putting this together. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say, uh, uh, thank you to Jean Milant. I actually started at Sirius Editions and he introduced me uh, by default to Jean Baldessari since I was the, uh, the main printer there. And um, so I did some of the uh, prints up to 1993 at Sirius. I mean, uh, yeah, 93. I opened up my, uh, my print shop in 1990 and um, uh, because I did know John and at the time I had been working with uh, uh, Mexico City artists and LA artists. I had been uh, with the idea of in internationalizing uh, uh, the Los Angeles conversation and in particular the uh, Chicano aesthetic and um, and I actually proposed at some point to John to see if he would be interested in doing something connected to the border, hmm. uh, and specifically because the border at that time and it still is a uh, a very contentious uh, issue. And uh, he agreed. And uh, as uh, everybody has mentioned, he was. Uh, he was uh, very giving uh, in terms of uh, leeway uh, 
to ways of proofing the uh, imagery that uh, he provided. Uh, in this particular case, since the conversation uh, has gone a little bit towards the technical side, um, what I did uh, um, was that I had uh, developed uh, with this photographer, Pamela Blackwell, a continuous tone uh, film, which means that it does not have any uh, half tones. And uh, I printed this image in three different details in uh, uh, Japanese paper for the most part, uh, translucent, and they were um, registered at the top so that when you look at the uh, print itself, the uh, information gets added through the translucency all the way down to the uh, support paper, which also has uh, another uh, print. And uh, originally, uh, this print was, uh, was called um, uh, Two Horses and Riders with Blue Parrot. Uh, and actually, it, it, uh, it has some uh, identifying uh, symbolic uh, ideas to the, uh, to the Mexican flag. Uh, mm. the, the blue parrot, which was a uh, very uh, um, um, graphic image of, uh, of a parrot being held by two hands, uh, it actually reminded me of, uh, of uh, the eagle and the serpent in a commentary um, uh, in a commentary uh, to uh, be in place any, any, any distance from the two riders is a commentary uh, to the border where you stand with it. Ah, um, I see, I see. I was, I was just gonna make a comment about that, like sort of a bicameral kind of effect. I, I mean, it's not a diptych exactly, it's like, but this like kind of like bicameral effect. Um, uh, you know, maybe I, I don't mean to cut you short, Francesco, but no, it's um, fine. It's maybe fine. I, I just I mean, we only have a limited amount of time. And I was thinking I could bring in uh, uh, Jacob, Jacob Samuel into uh, the conversation. I mean, no, sure. it's, it's a remarkable print, Francesco. That's an amazing uh, instance of uh, that, I, that idea. Um, you, Jacob, do you want to? Um, yeah, sure. Happy to. Uh, can you see me? I, I, I can see you a little Good. bit, actually. Okay. <laughs> you're a little bit, you're a little bit hidden there. I, I don't so, know if I can. So um, I'll, I'll just um, run through this. Um, so go back to the last slide, please. Um, so that's my, my former studio. And the thing about my former studio is it's right across the street from John's studio. So, um, I mean, I could literally, we, we could l see each other from our front doors of the studios. And mm. he lives in my neighborhood, so I saw him all the time. And uh, this is John with Dan Graham, who is a friend of his and who I did a project with. So the reason this is here, I didn't have a picture of John and I together, but because John was in and out of my studio quite often, and I worked with a lot of artists who were friends of his, and then he also introduced me to a lot of artists who were his friends and wanted me to work with. Wow, so it sounds are, like the, Grand Central. You were running yeah, Grand well, Central yeah, yeah. there. Well, I'd say it's, the, it's, it's two guys who like to be left alone, but like each other. Uh -huh. So uh, anyway, um, so yeah, he was just great. Um, when he, I, I, uh, I met him in the late 90s. I, by the way, I just want to say the first work I ever saw of, of uh, John's was what John Lamb published, The Raw Prince. That was my first exposure to John's work. And might as well just say too, what a great influence John Lamb was on me. Hmm. So, um, and also you, we you were talking about Gemini too. I, I was with Gemini in 1881. So I've kind of come through all through the LA print deal <laughs> and I'm from LA. So um, anyway, uh, so John, uh, there was this video store in our neighborhood, Vidiots, it was great. And John was there all the time because he loved old movies and I'd see him there all the time. And then I was working, I was doing a lot of work in Europe with a lot of people that John knew, uh, Rebecca O'Horn, Yanis Kunelis, uh, Marina Abramovich. So, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, and once I was working with Rebecca, 
And she said, asked me how John was. And I said, well, I don't really know him so well. And she said, well, the next time you see him, just you know, tell him I say hi. So I saw him at the video store. And I said, hey, John, uh, you don't know me, but I've been working with Rebecca. And she wanted me to say hi. And he said, what have you been working on? I told him. And then he invited me over to his studio and she said I should bring whatever I've been working on because he'd like to see it. And so I brought a bunch of projects with artists that he was familiar with and mm -hmm. friends of his. And so then he, he just said, he, he just volunteered. He said, well, give me a month and I'll come up with a project. I didn't even ask him to work with me. <laughs> you know, he was like, give me a project. Rather, give me a month. So I gave him a month and he had this idea, you know, he collected old movie stills. And so the first project we did is called Some Narrow Views, Some Vertical, Some Horizontal. And what they are is they're photo reviewers of um, uh, cropped movie stills within a word underneath them printed in a letter, pr letter press. And they go between uh, horizontal and vertical. So on the wall, they kind of have this nice rhythm going on. And uh, anyway, that, it was about, for me, I'd say maybe an eight month project to do this thing. And, uh, but it came out real well and he was real happy. So, uh, and it's a very funny project. I think it shows what a funny guy he is, great sense of humor. Uh, and then uh, yeah, the first thing he did when, he, when we signed the prints was he said to me, you got to work with Chris Burden. Here's Chris's number. Tell him I told him to call. So then I did a project with Chris Burden. And then after that, he said, you should work with Matt Mullican. You should work with Rita McBride. And then, you know, people that I was working with were friends of his came into town, like Dan Graham and Christina Iglesias and Julio Sarmento. Again, I work with a lot of Europeans. Yeah. So, uh, so John would just come over and hang out. And it was great. And then John said to me, uh, you know, I got, I, know, I got this young artist I'd like you to work with, Annalia Saban, and so I did a print with her right off the bat before uh, she, uh, anybody knew about her, and, and so that was fun, too. Uh, the thing about John, so John also lived in my neighborhood, and I just want to say, like, I'd be walking my dog, and I'd go by his house, and he'd be on the front porch, and then he'd invite me up to sit on the front porch with him, and we'd talk about art, we'd talk about the neighborhood, and uh, he's just incredibly friendly and extending to me. Um, I felt very, very fortunate. I, I found him to be a most generous and giving person. Um, this one time, there's another series we did. It's coming up. If you go, if you scroll through him, the last thing we did was uh, he called me up and he said, I got this idea for a project that's really different than the last thing we did. And then he invited me over to uh, see the work. And he did these six drawings, which are called, um, I don't remember what it's called, but it's, it's six ear drawings in mm -hmm. complementary colors. And so, uh, and they're all different. They look kind of the same from a difference, but they're actually, there's a lot of nuance in the drawing. And it kind of, it's funny because when we were looking at uh, the raw prints, I really could see the similarity in the drawing style uh, on that one print with the orange blouse at, at the bottom. And so it's really not, it's not that it's coming out of nowhere. It's just he's drawing on a lifetime of experience working on these things. And so, yeah, he was pretty happy with this project too. And, and uh, you know, I just see him around all the time. and. Uh, He's just incredibly friendly and giving and generous. And uh, I, I felt very fortunate to work with him. Uh, what I find interesting is also that you work with these artists that, who came to you by uh, recommendation. And it's almost as if it, it's an extension of his work at Cal Arts, you know, educating oh, artists yeah. who he later sent to New York mm -hmm. and all around the world who gave birth to the pictures generation who you've worked with like multiple schools, all of them sort of spooling out from John's, you know, the constant, you know, the constellations, uh, you know, around, around John, which mm -hmm. I think is, is fascinating. That's yeah. uh, amazing. Uh, I guess we can just hope that that can, I mean, are you, you're still working with, obviously you work with uh, uh, Aaliyah and- um, No, I'm not working anymore. I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I just teach. I just teach two afternoons at UCLA just to keep my hand in. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to say one thing uh, that John said to me that I think everybody will relate to. Uh, once we were working, and he said, "You know what I think?" I said, "What?" I said, "I think we both value the life of the mind." And yeah. So that's something about John. I think you know he had that. He's a very cerebral, thoughtful person. Okay. Very cerebral, which is, I, yeah. I guess, but one reason funny. why. I'm sorry. Oh, very, I'm very interrupting. Funny. Yeah. But yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I guess, and that's what sort of 
um, draws us all together. I mean, this he was incredibly cerebral. He was um, someone who we always associate with like a certain kind of, you know, abstract, uh, abstraction basically. Um, and uh, yet who was, became very involved with a, a very process oriented, hands-on kind of um, uh, process. And um, so, I mean, that's what's kind of uh, amazing to, to have that kind of collaboration. Um, so uh, where do we want to take it from here? Does anyone want to, um, does anyone have questions or other comments? Comments, questions? Oh, I see. I, I, I wasn't even yeah. waiting for a card. I was thinking like questions, comments among the lot of us. Um, yeah, we, uh, we're we're happy to uh, open it up to a Q&A if, if, if anyone wants to pitch in on the uh, Zoom chat uh, function. Um, we, we can start uh, answering questions or if any of the panelists want to, you know, keep riffing. It's all good. Okay. Uh, we do have one question about um, if anyone can speak on the brain cloud image. Um, no, I love that. Right there. That image. Um, I could speak on it. Uh, it was a an image. He actually used those images in many, many different works um, over the years. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that print um, came in the um, in the scheme of all all of the uses of that. But he made a sculpture of the brain cloud, a huge sculpture. Um, he for his um, pure beauty retrospective uh, that oh, went right. uh, to the Met. Um, we did these huge, large um, mural prints, basically one of the brain cloud on a blue background and one of the palm tree seascape. Um, and in this print, basically, he like merged the two. Um, but yeah, he was really using, I mean, even past those works, he really kept on using uh, this imagery. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's so something, you know, it's funny, we, we, we find certain configurations that John is, uh, so he, he sort of oscillates between different kinds of configurations. I mean, he's very much drawn to um, the sort of not abstract, like narrative configurations of film noir. And then on the other hand, he's drawn to these somewhat more, um, you know, succinct, almost geometric configurations of elements, um, you know, which he sort of uses in a kind of um, uh, pedagogical way, you know, this kind of like, it's like the wrong is right kind of thing, the wrong uh, sort of uh, configuration, those configurations, his fascination with like the surreal or the blur between his kind of the abstract work and this kind of surrealism that we sometimes associate with Magritte. And again, always that sense of like, you know, cognition and knowing. Um, you know, our very human sense, our, our, our very human capacity to project. There's always these things going on, but it's interesting the way to see the way he goes back and forth between these different kinds of configurations of, of imagery and shapes and, um, and so forth. That, that I, I always find that very fascinating. I mean, it's like, you know, I was like looking at those ears and I was, the ears made me think of the nose. And, well, I think the um, nose is interesting. I mean, he's used the nose from very early on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the same way as this brain cloud. And yeah. um, someone asked him once, how come you're always doing these noses? And he said, God only knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great, great sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it was very serious, but it was I mean, it was I, I mean, very, very serious. But at the same time, 
he was introducing this element of chance of uh, of unknowing into it of unpredictability and which i think is maybe fed into his collaborations with all of you in that he was very open to you know the random the chance the like well what about this color what if this color comes out a, a different way maybe that's okay you know we just go forward from there we uh, one series germinates another entirely right. um uh, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting um anyone and anyone do we have any other questions or is is someone going to feed me the questions or um, I'm not see I'm seeing that we're getting questions in the Q and A, but if you guys could um, put them in the chat, I'm not able to access the Q and A. So okay, uh, okay. So, so just look at the chat. Well, the um, chat. I'm I'm trying to get people who are asking questions to send them to the chat um, rather than the Q and A. Oh, I see. I see Q and A um, and then chat. Should I look yeah. at the chat? And um, no, no, I got it. So here's a question. If anyone could speak to um, John's use of photography um, or his relationship with photography. Okay. I think I started that off actually. Gave you guys a yeah. head start. Um, with the raw prints, he actually took those photographs, but I don't think most of his work were photographs that he actually took, right? I mean, they were found photographs. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to technically about his relationship to photography, but I think very few of the works, Brianna, am I correct on that or? Yeah. Um, there were some works um, really? when I first started that were, he might not have taken them himself, right. all the photographs, he, you know, but he would have people taking photographs um, right. about, you know, what, what he wanted photographed. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was, found or um, sort of curated and um, and he, you know, he just looked really like looking through images, I think. Right, of course. Yeah. And editing. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you walked into his studio, you'd see just milk crates and milk crates full of lobby cards and, and just images. They're just everywhere on his desk. He was constantly, right. yeah. constantly recirculating right. through images. Yeah, I remember um, that. Yeah. You could get file, cab file cabinets full of drawers of black oh, yeah. and white photos. <laughs> Yeah, he has a really great inventory of lobby cards and and stills, and right. he would just push through those. Um, I would have coveted those lobby cards. I have a few of my own, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I could turn this around. I could show you a few. <laughs> yeah, but I, th I think he he, I mean. I, I think he thought photography was there to be used, you know, and I mm. think it was available to him, um, which is really a really like contemporary, you know, way of thinking about like the circulation of images in general. Like he was definitely ahead of, ahead of that curve, um, but still kind of stuck to those black and white noir <laughs> pictures, which is really cool. But uh, yeah, they were they were they were his to use. Yeah, but and also, but also, I, I mean, I think he liked using those as a, as a, a, a deliberate contrast. That idea of narrative that he was going to not exactly subvert, but just say, you, like, you think you know what's going on here, but you don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but you or or what what you it, it's pure speculation. You know, he's he's very much sort of. Um, sort of eviscerating the images as as he's pulling them up, you know, he's he's taking it apart, and um, that I I find that I mean that's the abiding fascination for me. I remember um, reading once that he said that uh, he viewed images and photographs the same way like a writer views words, where they're already out there in the world for him right. to use. Right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need to make his own. He can use the images that we all have. We're all familiar and connect to us all that way. I'm I'm hearing something in the background. There's some yeah, sorry about that. No, no, it's it's fine. But I, um, is there? I, a li li I'm just looking at. I can move question. on to another question. Um, yeah, this yeah. one's actually uh, specifically for Francesco. Um, if you could speak 
um, to your relationship with John as a printer and um, if uh, that relationship was in some way a metaphor for his work or you know, if you could just speak to that uh, collaborative relationship. Whether the collaboration uh, with John and myself was a metaphor for his work, well, I mean, it's interesting that uh, you say that because I think that uh, I carried on a certain neutrality even when I started working with him at Del Nopal Press. I was, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the publisher and I'm the print and the printmaker. So I think that the visits that I had with him, uh, I think there was a certain amount of um, uh, silence and every so often he would say something. So I think the metaphor, and I had been thinking about that ever since this thing started being put together. I've been reading, um, you know, things uh, that I had reread before. And I think that the metaphor, the metaphor with that is that I, I, my presence and the silence that sometimes was created and then we come out with the print. That silence, I think, was the uh, the metaphor that I see in uh, the collaboration with uh, with John. In in that uh, that uh, that of course is responding to the idea that it, it is important what is there and also what is not there. So in that regard, I I could answer that question that way. I've been thinking uh, a lot about it and. I do miss him now, uh, mostly the moments that I wish I had uh, been more uh, in conversation with him. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here's another one. If, uh, if anyone can speak to uh, what drew Baldessari to the idea of multiples, um, specifically versus originals in painting. Yeah, I have something to say. <laughs> he, he once told me every artist should have a cheap line. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he also used to say he's coming out with his spring line. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, his spring line. or his cruise line. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, that, and that goes to that, yeah, that, that series that he did at Gemini. Yeah, the lines, yeah. It was sort of like also making fun of the sort of the elitist art world. And it's like now it's kind of, you know, more happening with all the young, a lot of artists actually making fashion lines, making mm. clothes with fashion houses and stuff. Like true. He, he was doing right. it, using it that way, like he's coming out with this new fashion line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, 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 I, I, he, and he, oh, I'm sorry, go on. Well, no, sorry, I, I, um, I also think that, of course, that's what he used to say, say but I think the, probably what is very important at is that this gave him the opportunity to explore ideas beyond his the realm of his studio because of all the interactions with the studios because each studio has a, a way of, of processing, let's say, the images, the, the ability to create a certain look and uh, I think John embraced that and made it its own, you know, part of his vocabulary. And he created a incredible body of, of, of prints, you know, the, the, he has a very thick catalog resume of prints too. But I think after we did The Fallen Easel, that's when he really just got really turned on by printmaking because he did a huge amount of prints after that. I mean, he was doing prints all the time. So um, it became a big part of his, his uh, work, yeah. Mm. I think it's like 300 or 400 some prints that he's done. I think there are more. More? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think also that the... Um, in some of the conversations that he had, uh, he was painting on painting on photographs as sort of like uh, bringing the photograph more to painting or vice versa. I think that the prints themselves, for me, they also address the issue that they're in a way they respond to his one of his 
preoccupations about that. He was looking at magazines as that's the way people communicate. And I think that when he went into the printmaking, both the part that was a painter and the part that was graphic or photographic became one because they were, you know, printed on a, either as an etching or as a lithograph or as a silk screen. And since there were multiples also, it sort of like responded to the whole preoccupation of uh, sort of uh, quote unquote mass dissemination, but at the same time, bringing together that area of painting and photography together. Yeah, or what we or what we might call in the publishing world the the page flip, you know, uh, just uh, turn over that image um, to the next, you know, in into a series um, is is what it lends. To, it, it obviously it doesn't lead necessarily in a straight line narrative way, but in a more abstract way. Um, this one image leads to another, the fallen easel. It's um, Im immediately engenders a series of consequences. So action, reaction. So um, I think I'll, uh, I'll ask one last question um, that I think is ties this together in a way um, relating to the, the totality of his work and it has to do with language. Um, if, uh, if anybody could speak to um, his interest in poetry, if he had a favorite poet, um, if, or if the words are just words. I mean, I think it was kind of many poets. I mean, when I was first getting to know him, he was very obsessed with William Carlos Williams in that moment. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think he, I, had, mm, I don't know. I I don't. I can't say that I know what John's favorite who who John's favorite poet was, but he was constantly reading, um, constantly reading scripts, um, poetry. You know, just just it. There were as many books on his desk and texts from various sources as there were images. So it really was this back and forth. Um, you know, they're interchangeable. Also, I, I would just add that, I mean, there is a poetry to the way he works with um, words and images. I mean, these are, if poetry is a, is a way of like sort of dissecting and cutting up um, uh, conventional prose into something, something poetic, uh, he is cutting up images sometimes with words, sometimes uh, by themselves, sometimes with other images, which function as words to create a different kind of, it's a, it's a language unto itself. It's a language that is not understood in, you know, by verbal cognitive means. Um, so, uh, I mean, something like this, like, you know, blah. Um, you know, obviously he's, he's, he's drawing on the meaning of those words, but we see all sorts of things in them, the, 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 configure, the uh, juxtaposition of the words, the images that we see through them, um, you know, the way they move. Um, it becomes its own, a, a new kind of poetry, a poetry of, of words and, uh, and uh, or even, not even words, uh, letters and colors or shapes and colors and graphic imagery. Um, I mean, we could say this about the way we look at certain film or, I mean, or we could look at any film that way. Um, and I think in a way, looking at this kind of work encourages us to look at everything in a very, in a very different way. I mean, in other words, forget about everything you know, because it ain't much. <laughs> it maybe ain't a lot. Um, and you need to go move on from there. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I love, I'm looking at this now and I, I love like Jay said, blah, a snore. It's, you know, you know, move on from there or maybe just fall asleep or maybe just catch a few Z's. Yeah. Those are his, that's his name mixed up. 
<laughs> I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also just wanted to say, you know, he has. So, if if, if you're interested in, in his engagement with language, um, I mean, John was a really great writer himself, like a fantastic writer. Um, and there are two, like a very honest, uh, casual kind of writer um, in a very intentional way. Um, and McCranston um, edited and Hans Ulrich Obrist edited um, uh, two volume uh, books uh, called More Than You Wanted to Know About John Bolt, sorry. And I think in those, I mean, uh, and I, I was very lucky when I first started working with John, I got to transcribe those, those writings um, and I always thought of the majority of those pieces as kind of sketches for him. I think in as much as he was like cutting up images and taping things together, there was, um, it was very evident that, that he worked through words to arrive at a picture or to know how to find or source a picture. He, he really did, um, uh, yeah, he was like a bit, a, a, you know, a bit of a poet himself, like to be mm -hmm. totally honest, I, I really believe that. Um, but yeah, he, he just, I just thought that that was a, it'd be a fun thing to check out if you're at all interested in, in a more immediate relationship to language, um, you know, look at his, his books of writings. Um, they're really fantastic. That's a great recommendation. Yeah. Do we have time for any more questions or? Are we? I, I think uh, I think that might have uh, been it. I, I did want to thank everyone, um, both for joining us and everyone um, on the panel for participating. This is a really uh, special thing, um, and we really did want to honor John Baldessari, uh, somebody very close to all of us and many people around the world for many many decades. And I will. Um, Pass it on to Anna from Artillery to um, wrap it up. Hey, yes, hi, I'm the publisher of Artillery. I just, I also just want to thank everyone so much for attending. Um, having the sense of community and discussion during this time is just wonderful. I've learned a lot. Uh, I did want to say um, that John, sorry, is our cover, and um, we are offering the issue for free. We just ask that you pay for shipping or um, if you want to find other ways to support artillery, we're certainly hoping everyone will subscribe for a year or uh, email me at publisher at artillerymag.com. Um, I'd love to hear what you thought of this. And I'd also love to hear what other topics you'd want us to do another Zoom virtual discussion on. Um, you know, please be honest and give us your feedback. We'd love to keep doing this. So um, thank you so much. and. Um, have a good evening, and I and I hope to see all of you guys again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye, Francesco. But bye. Bye. bye, Anna. Bye, bye Jacob. Bye, John. Bye, Ezra. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Bye.